Hello everyone. Today is Friday, April 6th. Um, as I promised uh, earlier in the announcement that I sent today, um, I'm apologies for not having integrity available uh, or integrity lecture available earlier. Um, I'm going to change that right now by recording this lecture. Um, you'll notice also if you go to course materials that the week 13 folder is already up. That I'm going to talk about in my next lecture. Uh, today I want to go over week 12 and uh, when you go to week 12 you'll notice the instructions that are here at the top, uh, introducing you to the research paper, which is due April 22nd. Um, that's a little bit more than two and a half weeks away, I think. Let's see, 22nd, yeah, uh, about two weeks and some change uh, between now and then. Uh, so there's still, you know, time's going to get really short, but I think within those next two weeks you'll have time. I apologize, my dog is yawning. Um, I want to go very quickly first into the instructions and the rubric for the research paper. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss very quickly about how to evaluate sources. And by sources here, I'm talking about popular sources. Um, after that, I'll talk about the week 12 discussion assignment. Um, some of you have already contacted me about this. I'm going to be a little bit more specific here. Uh, and uh, at the end, I'll, I'll try to review a little bit about what the plan is going forward, okay? Uh, so first off, the instructions are right here for the research paper. I've already opened them up here uh, separately. So let's go over that very quickly. Uh, when you open it, you'll notice that there's a, a grade here at the top. It's 20% of your semester grade. That's obviously a lot. Uh, there's a very, very short writing prompt. It's, it says, write an argumentative or analytical research paper based on the research you proposed in your prospectus. Uh, now I should add here, there's a small caveat, um, if for whatever reason you decided to change uh, your proposal, let's say you don't want to do that topic anymore, you want to do something completely different, that is perfectly fine. I am not going to uh, give you a, a worse grade because you didn't have continuity, right? Uh, so I'm not going to punish you if say from part two and the prospectus, oh sorry, part two in the research paper, if you decided to change topics, I'm not going to punish you for that. Um, however, the punishment will be in, inherently that you have less time now than everyone else who decided to stay with their topics. So um, that's to your disadvantage, but I'm not going to, uh, to punish you for that. Uh, so it won't affect your grade if you decide to change topics, uh, but we'll talk about um, continuity a little bit later. Um, if you're not sure what I mean by argumentative or analytical, um, I have a link here. Uh, to the Al Purdue page. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, it's, it's this uh, page right here that talks about what research is, what it isn't, and it gives you two types of research papers, the argumentative one and the analytical one. Uh, I went over those in a previous uh, lecture, so if you're not sure uh, what that was, please look at the week uh, 11 lecture, and I talked about that a little bit more there. Um, I did have some uh, crucial steps that you should follow um, here, so you know, part one or, or step one is that you need to determine which type of research paper you're going to write, meaning are you going to write an argumentative one or an analytical one? And this you should have figured out um, after writing both parts of your prospectus. Um, for part one, um, it was really just introducing you to a topic, right? I just wanted you to think about a topic that was interesting to you first and um, answer some questions that might help you think about um, uh, where you're going to find information and come up with a plan. Part two was really um, asking you to dive into the research and, and find out what the articles out there are saying uh, and find out really, are you going to write an argument, meaning the, the, the topic that you picked is very controversial still within uh, the research community and there's still something to be argued for one way or the other, or uh, are, are you perhaps going to look at this more analytically? You're going to look at your topic because um, you have a, a different stance, uh, not sorry, not stance, but a different view on the topic that no one else has really explored and you want to look at it differently. Well, that's fine too. Uh, so I'm going to explain both here in case you're not sure. Um, again, this uh, webpage does an okay job of explaining it. I'm going to explain it a little bit more here. Um, if you're going to go the argumentative route, um, there are two things you need to consider. One is that you have to take a stance on a controversial issue. Um, and secondly, um, you can see your goal here. Your goal is eventually to persuade your audience 
to accept your argument with convincing evidence. Now, some of you might not be sure what I mean here by controversial. Um, I'll give you a, a non-gender and non-racial example. Uh, global warming, for instance. Now, although global warming has been talked about a lot in, in popular media and so on, the news, for instance, um, it's not necessarily controversial the way you might think, right? Um, so one obvious question, and I've had this discussion with my students before, is, you know, is there such a thing as global warming? And if your answer is, well, no, it's not, that's fine, but you would have to also admit that 99% of the scientific community who deals with uh, the science related to our planet would tell you that that's uh, false. You, there is, of course, such a thing as global warming. It's been recorded. It's been measured, quantified, and, and, and validated in, in several ways. So it is very hard to dismiss uh, the fact that there is such a thing as global warming. And you might be quick to cite people like our own president, who may have on one uh, instance or another denied uh, its existence and said that it's simply a hoax. And that's fine, but the problem is our president isn't an expert in that field, is not a scientist and is not a researcher there. So they would probably not be the person you would likely use in an argument uh, to cite as, as a credible evidence. So when we talk about um, a controversial issue, we really do mean not because it's controversial in public, but that it's controversial um, in, within an academic setting. So within researchers or within a, a research community, what is controversial? So I, I gave an example here uh, uh, of something that's not controversial. Something like women should receive the same pay as men is not a valid argument because no one in academia would argue against you, right? So if you said something, again, back to the global warming example, uh, no one in the scientific community would say, yeah, you're, you're, you're wrong. There's no such thing as global warming. No, no one would. Uh, the very few people that probably would, would have been paid off by politicians to say that so that they have lobbying money. Um, so you have to be very careful um, with selecting your topic and determining whether it's controversial or not. Um, but in the global warming example, there is some controversy within the academic community, but it doesn't have to do with the existence of global warming. It has more to do with where it comes from, the source, the cause of global warming. Uh, so right now, the argument is, is it more synthetic, meaning is, is global warming caused by mankind, um, by our pollution, by our uh, production and assembly of things? Is that, are we leading the world to global warming? Or... Is it natural, uh, not necessarily caused by, by mankind, but rather that it's just a natural process that's been going on and on, and this is to be expected? There, we do have some controversy because we don't have any conclusive data um, or facts that would suggest one or the other. Um, so yes, we have some data that shows it's, it's man-caused, but we also have data that shows that this has been happening long before we actually had any sort of real impact on the Earth. Um, so that would be something controversial. Here, again, this example that women should receive the same pay as men, no one would argue against you. Who in the right minds would say, no, women definitely do not deserve the same pay as men? No one would. No one would argue against that. Uh, so therefore, that the issue isn't whether they should or not. Maybe it's something deeper. And so here, uh, I've included a, a thesis statement that actually came from an article I was reading recently. Uh, they said, although many efforts have been made to close the wage gap between men and women. So here they acknowledge that that's been a problem, right? It is a problem that women aren't being paid the same as men, but they're not arguing that it shouldn't be done or should be done. Instead, they go a little bit deeper. They say, corporations representing STEM fields are responsible for perpetuating something called occupational segregation. Uh, occupational segregation means um, that men are forced into one industry while women are forced into another. Um, for example, uh, or one very old example is uh, the medical field. Within the medical field, men are usually shoved into physician uh, positions, you know, like doctors and so on, while women are pushed into nursing at a, at a more subservient position. Uh, that's called occupational segregation. 
And here, they are making the claim, these, uh, the people that wrote this, are making the claim that it's the STEM fields, specifically corporations that represent STEM fields, are the ones responsible for segregating um, uh, industries by sex. So again, the issue isn't that uh, the uh, women not being paid the same as men is controversial. It's not. The issue here is that we don't know who's responsible for this so-called occupational segregation, and so they're looking here at the cause. Similar to the global warming example, we're not looking at whether there is global warming or not. We care more about where it's coming from. So that would be one example if you're going to do something argumentative. You have to consider that um, there's got to be some disagreement within the academic field you're looking at. So if you do enough scholarly research and you find that some articles are disagreeing with each other and they're not sure what the cause is, that would be an excellent place to start if you want to do something argumentative. If, however, you want to do something analytical, uh, there are two different things you're doing now. One is that you have to analyze an issue, an artifact, or a phenomenon. I'll talk about what those mean a little bit. And your goal should be to offer a critical interpretation of sources that will support your analysis. So first of all, what do I mean by uh, analyze or analysis? Well, and I've said this before, but an analysis is taking something whole, some one thing, and breaking it into its parts. And by studying those parts, you should then be able to understand the whole better. Um, so, for example, and I, I've, I've, again, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, this is my smartphone. It's an iPhone. Um, it's one thing, but if I wanted to, I could break it apart and look at its camera, its um, uh, processor, its... Uh, hardware, it's the materials that were made out of it, and so on. And by looking at each of those things, I should then have a better idea of not just how it works, but also its value as a whole, right? By knowing the, the, the value of each of those pieces, I know the value of the whole thing. That would be the same as, in this case, analyzing an artifact. So let me talk about what each of these words mean. Uh, an issue is your topic or your problem that you're looking at, right? Uh, an example of an issue would be something like br police brutality. It's not something you can like, point at and say, well, that's police brutality. Um, it's a little more complicated. It's more abstract than that. Um, so you might look at the issue as a whole. Again, within police brutality, well, what are some of the parts? We have uh, the police officer. We have uh, the assailants or victims, depending on the, the circumstances. Uh, we have the, the time and date and so on that affect that. We have the neighborhoods or the location that affects it and so on. So we have all the sort of con contextual parts that need to be dissected too. So that would be an issue. An artifact is something more physical. Um, it, this includes things that you can sense, things that we can perceive with our senses. So things that we can taste, touch, smell, hear, uh, and see, right? So these would be anything that's really producible, right? Uh, one example would be uh, like a movie, right? You can watch and listen to a movie uh, or a song. You can listen to a song or a book because you can read a book, you see it and so on. Um, food or clothing, same thing. Uh, those are all artifacts. A phenomenon is a little more complicated than both of those. A phenomenon is more of an event, a happening. Uh, things like this would include movements, like the civil rights movement would be an example, um, or things like um, the uh, trending hashtags like Me Too and Time's Up and Black Lives Matter. These are all uh, uh, movements. We can't really measure them, uh, but we can see that these things are happening and, and growing, uh, so we can look at those parts too. Now, again, the idea to, in order to write a successful analysis, we need to recognize three things. Um, and I've highlighted them in certain colors and given examples uh, with corresponding colors. So first of all, we have to identify what the whole is. The whole is the, the one thing. This could be a whole issue, a whole artifact, or a whole phenomenon, right? Th we have to dissect that whole to study its parts, right? And the parts can be, again, if we're looking at an issue like police brutality, well, then you have to look at who's involved in that issue. If we're looking at an artifact, we have to look at some of the things that make up the artifact. If we're looking at a phenomenon, we might have to look at what are some of the events that are leading to this phenomenon. Uh, and then of course, we're looking for shared, what we call features or patterns that we see that are shared among all of those parts. 
So I gave in some examples here. Uh, we might look at a feature like a gender bias within the lyrics of several songs. Notice song would be the artifact. It's the thing we're looking at. Within a song, we have things like music, lyrics, composition, um, but we're looking at lyrics specifically. That's the part. And we want to look at gender bias because um, gender bias doesn't appear in all lyrics. It might appear in some. And so we want to see what sort of patterns we find there. Uh, same thing with racially charged rhetoric of tweets, uh, homosexual symbolism in contemporary movies, uh, homophobic language in political speeches, and so on. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of the green things here, songs, movies, tweets, political speeches, uh, a lot of these are actually artifacts. And those are the easiest things, I think, to analyze because they're, they're things that we can physically touch, you know, see, hear, smell, taste, and so on. Um, it's harder to do that with issues or phenomena, but you're still welcome to try. Uh, again, the, the goal is to offer a critical interpretation. And by, by interpretation, I mean like, well, the meaning. How do we know uh, uh, what the value or meaning is behind these items, these issues, these artifacts for these phenomena? Uh, by critical, I mean it's got to be a little bit more in-depth than just simply saying, oh, it's bad or it's good, right? You have to go deeper than that. Ideally, you're going to look at sources that support your analysis, both primary and secondary, but mostly primary, right? If we're looking at songs, I don't want to read someone else's analyses of songs. I want to analyze them myself, right? For it to be my analysis, to, for it to be an original analysis, it has to be mine. It has to be original. So if I'm just reading other analyses and bringing them together and say, well, here are all the analyses and this is the one I agree with, well, that's not the same as a research paper. Yours has to be uh, unique and different. Uh, and actually, that goes the same for uh, the argument as well. They have to be original. Whatever your argument is, it can't be the same as someone else's uh, argument that's already been said. If you're doing analysis, it can't be what else someone else said. If you're just rehashing arguments and analyses from other work, it's not worth the research, and it is considered plagiarism. So you're going to have to be careful there. Um, I've also given some directions about how you should uh, construct the paper. And there's five parts. Notice I say uh, parts or sections, not paragraphs. So there's going to be way more than just five paragraphs. Um, so to begin with, you need an introduction to your research topic. Uh, uh, that could be, you know, just some, some basic context uh, for where your topic comes from, maybe even why you chose it and make it personal. Uh, but ultimately, you have to include your thesis, your, your, your main point uh, for the whole paper. And of course, I, I strongly recommend that you include any preliminary non-scholarly information for context. Uh, to give an example, Barbara Jean Fields did it in her article, um, Slavery, Race, and Ideology in the United States of America. Um, we covered it when we, were, when we were talking about race. And she began her article by talking about that sports commentator who, who said some really odd things about black people in sports. Uh, and she continued it with mentioning a journalist who seemed to agree with that same commentator. Um, so she's talking about two um, popular sources, again, non-scholarly, neither of those two people were academics or researchers or scholars in any way. Uh, so she took, again, those two popular sources and simply used them for context, to give some sort of context for um, for her argument, which was that, you know, this is where historians um, have brought us to. We are the ones responsible for people talking and thinking like this. We need to do something about it, right? So that's, that gave her some context. Um, second, I want you to review the literature that's related to your topic. And you did some of this, hopefully, in part two of your prospectus already. And this was sort of in preparation for the research paper. So uh, for your part two of your prospectus, I asked you to Take two scholarly peer-reviewed journal articles, summarize them, and evaluate them and to show how they are relevant to your topic. So you would have already had some practice doing this, but the idea is that you're going to do this with hopefully more sources so we can clearly see what the context, the authoritative context is for your research, right? Um, something along the lines of, well, here are, here's what recent scholars, um, or I'm sorry, scholars have found recently um, about this topic, uh, they seem to all agree on this, or there's, there seems to be questions of this, or this is some issue that's going on, um, but here's what we still don't know, 
right? The idea is that you're going to show a gap in the research, right? that there's something that still hasn't been figured out or there still hasn't been some, some argument that, that's been explored. And that's where you come in, right? That's where you're going to insert your own, again, original or new idea. Um, once you've done that, then you have several body paragraphs that, can, that should outline your argument or analysis, right? This is where you actually get to talk about your argument. You get to uh, reveal your argument, reveal your, your uh, analysis. And this is where you would also discuss and interpret any relevant sources, right? Um, so, if, for instance, if you're doing an analysis and you're using uh, movies, for instance, or TV shows, well, then you would hopefully discuss TV shows. You wouldn't discuss other people's interpretation of those shows. You would, dis you would discuss your own interpretation of those real shows. Uh, if you're doing an argument, well, there you might look at secondary sources. You might look at so-and-so's analysis and so-and-so's argument and say, well, they're both wrong or one's clearly more right because of these reasons that I found elsewhere, right? Again, never repeating what other people have done already, but bringing in your own information. Uh, two more things. Uh, you should also have, finally, a discussion of your findings that either persuades your audience to accept your argument, if you're doing an argument, or it reveals a new analysis of the topic, okay? And finally, you should have a conclusion. Um, now, I, I've left my description here of what a conclusion is very vague. But I will say the one thing I do not want you to write for the conclusion is a summary, right? I don't want you to write a summary of everything you've just said uh, because your paper, frankly, isn't that long enough. It's, it's not um, deep enough or complicated enough that you need to summarize it for us. Um, for longer papers, that's okay. Um, and I'm talking, again, 20, 30 page papers, that's normal. But here, this will be a very short paper, uh, which I'll show here in a minute or just now, is that it's going to be at least 1,500 words, but I don't expect you guys to go more than 2,000. Um, that doesn't include, the 1,500 words does not include the works cited page or the headings. Um, so just the content of your paper. Now, your paper should be double-spaced with one-inch margins. It should be typed in Times Roman 12 point font and generally just formatted in MLA style. Make sure you're following MLA style and not... APA style. I've, I still have a few students who are doing that. Um, so this is due again, April 22nd, end of day. Uh, so let me go over the rubric now so we can talk about how I'm going to grade um, your paper. So you'll notice there, there are five categories just like the other rubrics. Notice the organization is still the same. Um, that has been the same since the beginning. Uh, I'm looking at two parts, how you um, write or how you organize your paper globally, which if you follow, I'm sorry, let me that got ahead of myself. If you follow the instructions, these, these five parts right here, that is an easy way to get uh, uh, a, uh, a three, right? Because global movement is strong, okay? Um, but the hard part is the local, and that's, that's you know, how you move between sentences, how you organize your idea within a paragraph or within each paragraph. That's a little bit harder, and that if you do that well, you can get a four. If not, just a three then, okay? Uh, but there are a few new things. Uh, the literature review, that's, again, the same as what we covered in part two of the prospectus. Um, I have something new called an argument, sources, and citing, and I've combined sentence clarity, diction, and mechanics. Um, so rather than ha counting separately, they're just combined here. Okay? So for arguments, um, ideally, you should make a compelling, logical argument and demonstrate the impact of your research. Uh, you should also incorporate literature from various points of view and multiple perspectives so that you arrive at an insightful conclusion. Okay. Um, obviously, if you have minor gaps in logic or structure, or if you didn't explain yourself in certain places, that's obviously going to hurt you, and you won't be able to get a four anymore. Um, for your sources and your citing, um, Ideally, you would incorporate each source effectively and comprehensively, meaning you don't just pick and choose uh, whatever you want from the sources. Ideally, you will pick as much of the source as possible so that you're incorporating the whole source, not just, oh, well, this is a very good sentence on the first page that I really like, so I'm going to use that. Yeah, that, that will not work, okay? Um, you should also demonstrate the contribution of the literature to your topic, right? That you picked certain sources because they, they gave you something worthwhile, not just because um, uh, it was the only thing related to it. Um, if that's the case, then that's not very good research. 
And finally, uh, you give credit to sources when appropriate and transition seamlessly between your voice and the voice of the sources, right? Um, for instance, if you're quoting, it's not like just, here's the quote, here's mine, right? There should be a sort of a tie-in between quoting and you. Um, and if you're not sure how to do that, I have a few excellent resources that I can show you um, that will help you with that. Um, you can easily bomb this section of sources and citing if, of course, you don't use any sources. If you don't use any sources, that's pretty much automatic failure. Um, if you don't show how your literature relates to your topic, if it just seems random uh, and, and disconnected, well, that's going to hurt you too. And worse, if you don't give credit to sources, right? Let's say you do include sources, but you didn't give credit to them at all. Um, either because you forgot to include a works cited page or you never cited in your paper um, or both, uh, then that's plagiarism and that can get you into some serious trouble, okay? Uh, so if you have any more questions about the rubric, again, feel free to ask and I'll be happy to clarify if, if the language is a little confusing. I'll be more than happy to explain myself here. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about today and then I'll end the video is how to evaluate uh, sources. I have this little interesting sheet called uh, the CARS checklist for evaluating sources. Um, it has this little silly picture of a car here in the, in the side. That's funny, I guess. It's, it's an easy way to remember. But CARS stands for credibility, accuracy, reasonableness, and support. Uh, you'll notice that each box has a goal. This is ideally, if you could find a source, what should it contain? Um, this uh, checklist is really great for internet sources. This does not include scholarly sources, right? The, the stuff that you find in Google Scholar or the stuff that you're going to find uh, at the library databases. This is more for, uh, for sites like, and this is the page I was opening up earlier, things like CNN or things like New York Times. Popular news sources, um, things that are clearly rife with advertisements and uh, things asking you for things like a subscription every month. Uh, or things that just throw advertisements like this one that go across the entire page. Um, so uh, I usually don't like to use these sources at all, but if you're going to, here are a couple of questions you should consider for yourself. Uh, one, if you're looking at how credible something is, we need to first ask ourselves if we can identify who the publisher or sponsor is, and if that publisher or sponsor um, is an authority on the subject, meaning what makes them experts on this? Um, is there an author listed? And if so, is that author also an expert on the subject? How would we even know that, right? Ideally, if let's say we find a journalist, well, maybe the journalist has a background in that topic um, or has been doing this for so many years that they, that they know the topic well enough now. Um, if there are problems with the site itself, meaning like spelling errors, grammatical errors, links that no longer work, dead links, uh, or other problems that show that the quality isn't that great, well, maybe we probably won't use those sites anymore. Um, think about accuracy. Um, if we have um, information on our site that doesn't agree with other sites, well, maybe that, that there's some uh, disconnect there. I mean, if, if the majority of sources seem to agree on one thing and another disagrees, well, then chances are it's not true and we should probably disregard it. Um, if it contradicts itself, even more so. Um, if the document was uh, published recently, um, that might be good, but it might also be bad, especially if it's a news story. News um, sometimes or just stories develop with time, um, so it might be too recent, right? If it was published just that morning, um, then maybe there's still a lot that hasn't been revealed yet. Um, vice versa, if it's too old, maybe years old, maybe the story is no longer relevant, right? Um, we also want to make sure that the site is updated recently or regularly so that we know someone keeps uh, the site maintained. Finally, we also, or not finally, uh, thirdly, we want to make sure that the, tr the source is truthful and unbiased, meaning it's objective. It doesn't try to take one side or another. Um, if this, you know, the author, the host, publisher, or sponsor has a bias, well, then we might have to be very careful when we read it because it's going to take a certain slant. Uh, some sites will openly tell you that they are uh, either very conservative or very liberal. 
Uh, sometimes we also want to make sure that you know when we're looking at the site, we understand why the site's even there. Why was it created? Sometimes they're just trying to sell something. Other times they're trying to show um, a specific viewpoint or belief. Other times they might be trying to educate, but maybe educate in a certain way. Uh, lastly, we also want a source that has um, ways that we can verify that the information they have is correct. So if, uh, if a site doesn't have any sources at all, well, that might be sort of some red flags raised because then we have no way of double checking that they, what they said was correct. Um, and if we do have sources listed, can we even check those, right? If they have sources, but it's convenient that we can't check them, well, then should we even believe them? And lastly, is there a way to contact um, either the author or the organization directly? Um, if so, it might point to the fact that they are open to communication and are willing to share as much information as possible. If not, well, then it seems like they're closing themselves off and their point isn't really to share information. So this is all stuff that's really important and, and crucial when we're looking at, again, popular sites. Or, for instance, if I go to Google and decide to um, search for something like, uh, I don't know, sexual harassment, uh, and, and I look for you know, the very first uh, thing, uh, the first site I'm looking at, chances are this is a popular site. In this case, this is a government site. I would have to double check to make sure that this is even uh, legitimate, right? Um, so these are all things to consider. Um, nothing, I think, shocking or, or, or new to you, uh, but I hope that you take your time to understand um, uh, where your sources are coming from to make sure that it's strong information. Otherwise, you could easily um, lose track of your, your argument or your analysis. Okay, as always, if you have more questions for me, feel free to, to email me or text me. Um, I did have uh, a student call me recently, um, so I am still, again, available uh, as long as we try to schedule a time that works for both of us. Okay, so I'll see you guys next week, um, and don't forget your discussion board. That was the last thing, I'm sorry. That was the last thing I want to cover today is the discussion board instructions. Um, so there were two parts to week 12's discussion. Um, uh, the, the first part was that you had to write a summary and evaluation of a scholarly peer-reviewed journal article and a popular source, meaning not scholarly. Again, like CNN, uh, MSNBC, Fox News, so on and so forth, right? Those are all popular sources. So um, you were going to have essentially two paragraphs, one for the scholarly peer-reviewed journal article and one for the popular source. And, of course, you needed to cite the sources in MLA. Uh, when you summarize and evaluate, I wanted you to answer not necessarily all the questions, but as much as you could, right? So what arguments does the author make? What is their thesis? Uh, what stance are they taking? Is, is he or she even considering the opposite side? Uh, does this support or challenge your own position, right? And I, and I mentioned here, please don't get rid of a source just because it disagrees with you, right? If you don't show any sources that disagree with you, then there probably wasn't an argument to begin with, or worse, um, uh, you were only taking one side and, and you wouldn't be very persuasive or convincing to the side you are trying to persuade. Uh, if if uh, the source is challenging you, do they provide any convincing evidence? Uh, who is the intended audience for that source? And finally, what is the source's purpose? Okay, so that's, again, for part one of discussion board, that's due, or that was due, Eight, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday night. Uh, the second part is due by tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening, and this is where you're supposed to reply to three different threads or three different students, and you have to answer these questions in response, right? One, could you find the source that they listed, right? They were supposed to cite an MLA format. Can you find it based on their citation? Um, was the summary that they provided clear, uh, or were there areas of confusion that need to be clarified? And finally, was their evaluation clear? Or were there questions that they didn't um, address that they need to? Uh, this is all really practice for your research paper because in your research paper, that literature review is going to require you to summarize and evaluate. And if you don't do it well here, your peers should bring it to your attention and, and tell you that there are some problems with your source, or not with your source, with your summarizing or your evaluating of the source, and it needs some work. Okay? All right. Um, again, if you have any questions about the discussion board or any of the instructions I've placed here, feel free to let me know. Again, 
You can also review the, uh, the week 13 folder. I should have a, a integrity lecture for that one next week. All right, you take it easy.